Most League of Legends players know that Korea is the best region in the world. If you wanted evidence of this, you could simply point to the fact that Korea has taken first place in all five of the past five world championships. But I have an even more impressive stat to show you. This is a series from the 2014 Season 4 World Championships between the Chinese powerhouse OMG and Korea's Najin White Shield. It's a best of five that OMG is going to win convincingly, but this was honestly just bad luck for Korea. It was Bad luck that Na Jin, who was a fairly mediocre team by Korean standards, just had a lucky wildcard run to steal the last world's qualifying spot from the reigning world champions, SK Telecom. SKT, who is famous for performing well internationally, would have certainly done much better in this situation. It's also unlucky they had to face OMG right away. OMG was one of the best teams in this tournament who was just one game away from making it to the finals. Na Jin were completely ill-equipped to face such a powerhouse after not getting much good competition in the group stage to practice with. And the gameplay itself didn't even end up going their way. The series began with a level 1 invade that set Najin behind from the start. Level 1 fights and invades in early League of Legends, again, aren't even all that much about skill, it's more so just bad luck. So indulge me for a moment with a little thought experiment here. Let's pretend that this game didn't happen and just wipe it from the annals of history. If we do that, then we get a pretty interesting stat. Not only has Korea won won every single world championship five out of five times for the past five years, but Korea has never even lost a best of series to any non-Korean teams. They've dropped the occasional match in group stages, and once in a while they'd lose a single game in bracket, but no team has ever been able to successfully knock out a Korean team in a best of three, except other Korean teams. They almost always steamroll their way through bracket until they have to play each other, and then, after a very thrilling series that ends up being one of the most entertaining and close matches in the tournament, one will emerge victorious and continue steamrolling their way on to eventually winning it all. This isn't just Korea being ahead of other regions, regions or countries, no group of five players from any region anywhere has ever been able to come together and topple the kings of League of Legends, except for one ancient team that could make them bleed. It's kind of funny that Korea would end up being the region who dominate the league competitive scene since, although many have forgotten this, they were the last big region to get their hands on the game. In League of Legends, there are five major competitive regions, North America, Europe, China, Southeast Asia, and Korea. The reason they're considered the top five of the multitude of regions we have nowadays is they were given their own dedicated servers first before anyone else and naturally had a big leg up in the competitive scene in the early years of League because of it. North America and Europe were the first two regions to get the game as it would officially be released in late 2009. Shortly after that, Southeast Asia would be the next region to get dedicated servers as Riot would partner with the Singaporean company Garena, bringing League of Legends to that region in mid-2010. It's not entirely known when the official release date of the Chinese server was. Nowadays, China has at least 27 different servers, but the oldest and most competitive server, Ionia, dates back to at least May of 2011 when the game was available through a beta, although we know China had access to League of Legends way before that, at least as early as 2010. All of these regions had a leg up on Korea who were introduced to the game last, not getting their own dedicated server until just three weeks before 2012, but there were some Koreans who did have experience with League before that. Many Koreans played on the North American servers before they got their own and even formed a team to compete in the earliest known major League of Legends tournament, taking second place. In spite of this solid placing though, Koreans weren't exactly known for their skill in the early days of League. With Korean players, it's really specific because you always have under 50 ping, you don't speak English, and you play a lot of Shaco. And that's how you can tell you're playing with a Korean? Yeah.
Some Koreans made it to relatively high rating in the NA servers. Players like A Lilac, Corn Salad, Mock Noon, The Capped America, and Many Reason are some of the earliest examples of Koreans who would constantly be seen on NA streams playing with top pros at the time. However, most NA players didn't enjoy getting stuck with Koreans on their team. Plenty of Koreans were only good with a single champion like The Capped America and his infamous Rumble mid lane. If he got Rumble mid, he'd play the game at a plat level easily, but but if he was on any other champion or in any other role, his skill level would drop down to maybe low gold, high silver. The constant 150 ping Koreans had to deal with as well due to the distance of playing on servers halfway around the world also hurt their skill by quite a bit. This ultimately led to many Koreans being given plenty of loving nicknames from NA players like Chowster, who'd call players like Mock Noon or Many Reason, Mock Noob and Many Noob. It took a fair amount of time for the Korean release of League to roll around, but it wasn't just neglected from Riot that delayed the Korean servers from coming out, it was actually a very calculated and well thought out strategy. Riot knew a successful Korean launch would be imperative to having a massive competitive esports scene for many years to come. Korea, after all, is the mecca of esports. They have their own governing body, the Korean Esports Association, or KESPA, which is a member of the Korean Olympic Committee and an offshoot of the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. Professional gaming has been huge in the country ever since the late 90s, and there have been competitive gamers making a living off of playing games all that time. No country on earth has been more accepting of competitive video gaming than South Korea, so any game worth its salt better have a foothold in the country, and Riot was going to make sure that League had exactly that. The majority of PC gaming in Korea is done in internet cafes or PC bongs, so Riot wanted to make sure that League of Legends was installed on every computer in every PC bong and also had specific rewards for players who chose to play there. So for instance, if an account was being used in a PC bong, it would have every champion in the game temporarily unlocked and would also be given IP boosts for all the games played. This ensured that League was being played in a social setting where others could see the game, make their own account, have access to everything right away and join in on the action. Riot's strategy succeeded immensely well and League of Legends would quickly become the most played game in PC bongs, which is actually an accolade that the game still holds today almost uninterrupted for seven straight years. Koreans loved the game and they played it a hell of a lot. So naturally, with all that practice, they got really, really good. Players practiced a ridiculous number of hours, and all the pro gaming organizations in the country were quick to pick up official League of Legends teams. The country already being so entrenched in previous esports meant that there was already a decade of infrastructure that could be used to help develop the next great League of Legends generation. And that's exactly what happened. Back before 2012, North America and Europe went back and forth on claiming the title of who was the best region in the world. Europe would win one major with North America winning the next, seemingly always trading titles, starting an endless debate about which region was better. But while these two regions would bicker and battle back and forth on who was the best in the West, it wasn't long before the East showed them that regardless of who was better elsewhere, they were nothing compared to Korea. The first ever Korean tournament was the OGN League of Legends Invitational. This tournament was held in January of 2012, just one month after the Korean servers went live, but Korea had already gotten a fair amount of competitive teams ready to face the world. This tournament was interesting because there was serious international competition that attended. At the time, CLG was considered the best team in NA, as they recently swept both TSM and Team Curse two games to nothing in the last major, taking first place. This is also around the time when China started showing some dominance at international events, with their most dominant team being World Elite. Both of these two teams were well-established powerhouses and would be in attendance for this OGN Invitational, and the results were interesting to say the least. Unfortunately, none of the VODs of this event have survived, except for one uploaded to YouTube in fairly poor quality of the CLG vs WE match. This was a match that a lot of people were hyped for, as CLG would eventually manage to beat Team WE, and at the time, this was a huge development. Many in the world considered WE to be the best team out there, so when CLG knocked them out and managed to qualify for the finals of this tournament ahead of them, many Western fans were very excited. However,
However, a team known as MIG Frost, who would later be sponsored by Azubu, becoming Azubu Frost, would sweep CLG two games to nothing in the finals, establishing very early on that Korea was ahead of the pack. From here onwards, not many tournaments occurred where both Korean and Western teams would attend. There was one MLG Summer Arena that Azubu Blaze would show up to and sweep nearly every team in attendance, but there wasn't much action other than that. However, pro players in the West already knew that Korea was clearly ahead of the pack, so over the course of 2012, most pro teams from NA and EU would travel to Korea to compete in the 2012 Spring and Summer splits of the Korean League. There were some teams who chose to stay behind and take advantage of the fact that all the good local competition was in Korea preparing for Worlds so they could stay behind and sweep local tournaments for easy money instead of prepping for Worlds themselves, but this video isn't really about that. During the Korean League's Spring split, both the number one team from NA and EU, CLG and Fnatic respectively, would be in attendance. The two would travel to Korea to scrim against the local competition and see if they could accomplish anything during the spring split, staying there for a couple of months of boot camping and also preparing for Worlds. They would manage to make it out of the group stage by beating some of the lesser known Korean teams in the tournament, but the instant they got into bracket, they were both 2-0'd without being able to put up much of a fight. This showed the world even more evidence of how strong Korea was becoming. Not only were their best teams better than the best of the West, but even mediocre Korean squads could take down the best competition of North America and Europe. So during the second split, the 2012 summer split, plenty more teams attended, viewing this as a great opportunity to scrim and practice against the best competition available. CLGNA, Dignitas, Team WE, Na'Vi, and possibly the new best team in Europe, CLGEU, would all attend this time around. The trip would end up being more successful for some of these teams rather than others. For instance, the jungler of Team Dignitas at the time, I Will Dominate, got violently ill multiple times and ended up having to be rushed to the emergency room twice. Dignitas would finish at the bottom half of their group and be knocked out of playoff contention. But the CLG organization in particular would perform incredibly well this tournament. Both CLG EU and CLG NA would make it out of groups in spite of being placed in the exact same group and only having two qualifying spots. They managed to sweep both of the Korean teams that they would have to face and only ended up dropping matches to each other. When seeded into bracket, CLG NA would have a quick and disappointing exit to Azubu Frost once again, but CLG EU had a handle on things now. They'd sweep Team WE two games to nothing in the quarterfinals. They'd almost sweep Na Jin Sword, another incredibly good Korean team, three games to one in the semifinals, and were poised to take on Azubu Frost in the finals possibly having a chance to be the first Western team to topple a Korean and win a major tournament against them. And this ended up being one of the closest and most entertaining matches in League of Legends history.
Coming out of this tournament, the world was reminded that nobody could really beat Korea. The three best teams that Korea had to offer were almost impenetrable, so the two that made it to Worlds had high expectations riding on their shoulders. Najin Sword, who got the second seed, was the more laid back and fun team of the two. They were still the second best team in Korea, but they were more of a fan favorite. Their charismatic top laner, Mok Noon, who had been in the league scene forever, garnered them tons of fans, but ultimately it would be Azubu Frost who were the titans to beat. Frost had won nearly every single tournament they attended, be it the very first OGN Invitational or the very last summer split. They dropped a few games and a few matches to their sister team in the Korean League, Azubu Blaze, but seeing as they didn't qualify for Worlds, Frost didn't need to worry about much, so they got to work plowing through everyone. This fight and strong onto Reginald. He goes down. Dyrus is half health coming into this fight. They do drop down Cloud Templar. The one for one now, but slivers of health on the side of Team Solo Mid. Chaos grabbed into the fight. This is not looking good. And it replicates a final push that we've seen before. Team Solo Mid will drop game one to Azumu Frost at 40 minutes into the game. That grab. Rapid start going in. Pools under everybody. The damage going out. Chaos will fall. They're finding a special go down as well. So much health still shy. The Guardian Angel are coming back up for him. Freak the Nexus turns are going down. Club Templar is so tanky. They're trying to throw out Team Solo Mid. Trying to stop that path to the championships. And Azubu Frost will knock out Team Solo Mid. Get dropped, true shot for Ars goes across, Lee shreds some crescendo, Frog is gonna get dropped, Snoopy gets dropped, Frog is just about gets away, but the Vladimir Ultimate will finish him off, Yellow Pete is gonna go down, Wicked goes down, it is an ace, a Zubu Frost take it 13-0, total, total domination from a Zubu Frost. But Rapid Star is in there, Woog is in there, destroying the opposition. Grepper's gonna dance down. They have super minions coming up the mid lane. This could well be the end. That's an ace! That's the triple goal, that's the ace! That is the game! And Zubu Frost are in the finals! But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The one region we've conveniently left out of this video so far is Southeast Asia. They were the first region outside of NA and EU to get their own dedicated servers, of which include a player base that spans seven different nations. So naturally, they had a pretty intense competitive scene that began almost as early as the rest of the world. Two teams from the region, Team Pacific of the Philippines and Team Zan from Singapore, were even given direct qualifiers for the first world championship with some pretty intense competition. But it would end up being Taiwan, who would quickly become the best of the many nations included in the server, and at the 2011 World Cyber Games, they first got to show off their skills. 150 of Taiwan's top teams would enter qualifiers for WCG 2011, but the team that rose above the rest of them all was a team called For The Win. This was a team founded by two friends who went by the usernames Mistake and Stanley, an AD carry and top laner. They had met a few other players in solo queue that they wanted to form a competitive team with, including a pretty experienced jungler named Little Balls, who had previously played for CLG back in 2010. Little Balls was born and raised in Taiwan, but he grew up for a portion of his life and did much of his schooling in Canada, and one day, while he was in high school, he decided to skip school to go play video games at the local land center. When he did this, he ended up seeing one of his classmates doing the exact same thing, Big Fat GG, who was one of the founding members of CLG. 
Back at the World Cyber Games, Team For The Win would record some wins against the Malaysian team as well as the Swedish team in group stages. However, they'd end up losing to the French team as well as an early Korean roster which put them in the middle of the group and knocked them out of the tournament. Disappointed from their performance, the mid laner for their team, a player named A8000, would end up leaving. Despite their result, the organization who ran their server, Garena, took notice of their fine play and offered to acquire them becoming the team's official sponsor. After after agreeing, Garena renamed their team the Taipei Assassins, and the team got a new lineup. Firstly, their captain, Mistake, would transition from AD carry to support, so he could focus more on shot calling and less on mechanics, as their current support turned into a sub. An AD carry player named Bebe is a dog, who was an accomplished solo queue player and had a little bit of competitive experience himself, would also join the team shortly thereafter. They still needed to replace their mid laner, though, so the team opted to reach out to one of Bebe's former teammates a player from Hong Kong who went by the username Toys. Equipped with their new roster and their new name, the team quickly began entering tournaments to try and show others what they were made of, and it turned out that this, well, they were a pretty good team. One of the earliest tournaments they entered was the NVIDIA Games Festival of 2012. They were the only Taiwanese team invited going up against 10 of China's best teams on the Chinese server. Throughout the group stage, they didn't drop a single match to anyone, and once in bracket, they breezed past arguably the second best team in China at the time, a team called eHome. But unfortunately for them, they would just barely miss out on winning it all, losing two games to one against China's best team, World Elite. This would end up being one of the only tournaments where TPA would get international exposure. After this, they went mostly around to the various Taiwan qualifiers for major events. They went to the IPL5 qualifier and beat every other Taiwanese team without dropping a single match all tournament, where after that, they would attend arguably a more important regional qualifier, those that would determine Taiwan's representative for 2012 Worlds. This qualifier was structured into two parts. Firstly, you had to compete through an online regional qualifier to make it to the event. This included a round of 32 group stage, a round of 8 group stage, and a playoff bracket where the top four teams would make it to the live qualifier. At the live qualifier, only the best team head-to-head -head, would make it to Worlds as Taiwan only had a single spot to send a representative in. And once again, TPA didn't drop a single game. I don't know if I can make it clear how dominant this performance was. Playing so many matches throughout an extensive qualifying period and not dropping a single game, not even in any of the best of threes. I mean, some of the players on the teams they were going up against still play for pro LMS teams today. It's not like their competition were just pushovers. But TPA would sweep their competition yet again, which set them on course for Los Angeles. However, they'd run into a little bit of a speed bump here. CLG EU was at this event for a promotional stunt and was scheduled to play a show match with the champions of the region. After TPA won that title, they played their show match and got, quite frankly, destroyed. Keep in mind, CLG EU was one of the best teams in the West, of course, but this result didn't look good for TPA as Worlds was right around the corner. One of the important things to note about the World Championships of Season 2 in 2012 was that they had a very interesting feature in them, buys. In traditional sports, the best teams who are seeded into playoffs for post seasons are often rewarded with bye weeks where they don't have to play anyone and can choose to rest their players. The NFL, for instance, has a 17 week long grueling regular season where players must play week in and week out in a pretty intense environment. The immense toll taken on these players' bodies and just how compact their schedules are ends up with plenty of players exhausted and injured by the time the season's over. For instance, one injured NFL player was once asked if he'd be 100% ready and healthy by the time his next game rolled around as he'd be expected to start, where he replied, once the season begins, you're never 100% again. So the NFL chooses to reward the number one and number two seeded teams in each conference with a bye. This means that as they advance in the bracket, they get to go a little bit 
further not having to play the first week of playoffs so they can rest their players and better prepare themselves as a little postseason reward for all their success during the regular season. If you haven't noticed, League of Legends and its various esports leagues set up by Riot have been mimicking sports leagues practices for a long while in an attempt to set up the game to be a lasting esport for generations. American Gridiron style football in particular seems to have an influence on Riot, possibly because both of League's co-founders went to and met each other at a school that's famed for its 130-year-old football program. Wherever the influence came from though, Riot decided to structure the 2012 World Championships by rewarding four of the top five region's number one seeds with buys decided by a random draw. The Taipei Assassins were luckily one of the teams that were given a buy and seeded directly into bracket, as Azubu Frost was the unlucky team forced to play through groups. This meant Azubu Frost had to expose multiple strategies in the group stage and in their games in bracket, giving game film for competitors to study, while TPA could remain a relatively unknown team that others would have to face almost completely blind. Remember, the only two international teams who have any experience at all playing against them in an official tournament setting are Team WE and CLG EU. If they could avoid those two teams, they would have a big leg up on competition, but it's not like they would have an easy road. In fact, in hindsight, their buy out of groups might have been more of a curse than a blessing. TPA would have to beat the three best teams at the tournament to win Worlds this year. The very first team they'd have to face were Korea's Najin Sword. Remember, Koreans don't lose internationally except to other Koreans, and this tournament seemed like it was going to be no exception. Najin had easily 3-0'd in group stage, and they looked like they were going to stomp everyone to face Zubu Frost in the finals, but TPA were not discouraged in the slightest. Steel. The smite steel is almost certainly going to have to be used instead. They're going to stun us all. Snowballs there. The Ariana ultimate. That's going to be the absolute zero. Following up. Snowballs is taken down by Song. Song's going to get dropped immediately on the back of that one. They're going to turn their attention to Kane. Kane should go down on the back of this one. Yes, he will. And now they have the Jace pull from. Oh, they're going to fight. There's the Ariana the ultimate. Pops across. Toys dropped. Trey down before he had chance to react to that one. He gets a second. Song's going to get dropped as well. That's going to be Kongo picking it up. And Watch is going to get streamed down. A double kill. And that's going to be the dunk at the end with a triple. Kill. GG's given. That is going to be the best assassin taking game one against Nadia's sword. You may actually have this Kane. a little bit. They're, they're not falling back. They're going for Kane. I think they have the damage on him. He's going to fight away. Lil Wolf should be able to finish it off. Yes, he does. Gets the first blood. Through the wall here. Is it going to be a blind? He's coming soon. He's called back new. Can he do the damage on him? He does manage to get a lead strike away, and Nilbos has gone aggressive, he's gone deep, Crescendo comes across, they do manage to shut him down, that's going to be Song also going in there, manages to get the ball, kind of ultimate, they get the power of his arms, well, Song, Song's going to get dropped, that's a double kill for Toys. The fight in this corridor, so the Crescendo can get him. There's a the pull, back. they're coming around the back, there's the pull, the watch was coming around the back side though, this time Magnum is going to jump in, he's going to get onto the Toys, and Crescendo goes across, Nilbos is going to get dropped very quickly this time, could Najin Sword pull this fight back, they need to keep this fight up, they need to, or they will be out in this moment, so no, because Saipan says it's getting the whole ace off the back of that one. GG given. That is it. 2 0. Taipei Assassins. They take it. Taipei Assassins surprising everyone but themselves in here. They were the number one. Upon finishing their first series, they had made it to the semifinals in possibly the greatest upset in League of Legends history, at least until that point. Toys had established himself as an amazing mid lane carry already with his incredible Orianna play, but things were only going to get harder from here. Moscow 5, possibly the best Western team at the tournament and the favorites other than Azubu Frost to win it all, was their next opponent. M5 had come up in the scene quickly with their roster of Russian superstars, they had originally blown into the European scene with some crazy innovative and aggressive strategies like a very famous Nunu support. Since then, they had become an impenetrable wall. Every new tournament they came to, they would have aggressive strategies, always be pressing their opponents down, and crushing anyone who just sat back and farmed. You could always expect them to bring something new to the table, and you could always expect them to win. They actually give that Golem buff away to towards the beginning. They knew Uder can jungle without that kind of buff. But Toys wants that man to survive the lane. At the same time, they're pushing up for a gank. And this is what you get out of a squishy AP carry going down for first blood for Moscow 5. 
Diamond Prox coming in very big. He charges in to get the kill. Alice East coming up with that one onto Kogma. BB trying to blast out the true damage. And we are going to find Mistake on the chase. Stanley is quite hurt as well. Darian coming down to assist the fight. This is going to be huge for Moscow 5 if they can continue to micro themselves out of the damage. Little Balls is left by himself. His voice flashes away. The triple kill for Moscow 5. And it looks like they may be able to push on to the Nexus turrets in this one. They have a lot of tank behind their champions. Diamond and Gosu on the front. The first Nexus turret goes down. 23 to 7, 31 minutes into the game. That's all Moscow 5 needed for game one as they take it from TPA. Oh, so much stronger. And they've got the stun on the Gosu Pepper. Gosu not looking good. And this may be the first blood coming out. And BB comes up strong. A fight goes down. And look at that. A beautiful start. Oh, wow. They get Genjo right out. They are able to take him down. Mistake. Darian is, however, able to clean up a few kills for his team. It's now 3 to 3. A 4 to 3 now. Finally, the last auto attack and double kill for Toys. The ace on the Moscow. Five. Yeah, first Nexus turret, the second Nexus turret, the Nexus now, a game three, Moscow 5 forced to defend on the fountain, and it's going to be a huge matchup. Oh, Genja getting a crest on here down at the bottom, it does not look like he's in a happy place, and it looks like the ultimate will be able to light him. This is not looking good for Moscow 5, the ultimate onto Little Balls, they are going to drop Alex, the Guardian Angel triggering his diamond, Dragon's descent to the middle of the fight to blow cooldowns for his team, Toys, so much damage going down to him. Right on. The turret goes down. Darian gets caught out. He can't even open it. The Crescendo stopping them from using the abilities. Diamond Prox goes down. The inhibitor is open. The double kill comes out. Moscow 5 looking very grim right now. Taipei Assassins look to take down the last Nexus turret. And they will drop Moscow 5 from the League of Legends Championship Playoffs. TPA had already done the impossible. A second place finish here would have been amazing. They had already upset two of the top three teams in the tournament, and if they just put up any sort of fight against Azubu Frost, the undisputed champions of the world right now, they'd be welcomed back to Taiwan with cheers and glory. Nobody would expect such a high placing, and a quarter of a million dollars for second place would have been more than enough as long as they just played their heart out. Maybe just try and take a game from Frost in the best of five. He's going to show himself, and that's going to be the stun coming straight down. He's going to have plenty of time to land that bandage shot. It's going to be first blood stun. He's going to go down. It is going to be shy. Pick it up first. Oh, at the back. That's going to be cleaning up. Stanley. Stanley gets one. Stanley gets two. Maybe he gets the third one. That's going to be the double talk, but he might pop up oh. with this one. He gets the quadra kill. He gets the quadra kill. They dodge on towards Stanley. Stanley is the one that wants to take the damage, and immediately he turns into the rest of his Zoom Frost. There's the guns to the South Molly. Rapid start taking very low. They're going to use the Zonia's Hourglass straight away. They can't manage to take him down. Cloud Sampler will get dropped by Stanley. Immediately turned into Lil Moss. Takes down. Rapid start. The Stanley's going to get dropped. The Cloud oh. oh, it's a triple kill for Rapid Star. And now Wung and Shai should chase down Lil Now pushing down onto this Nexus. This looks to be the end for Zoom Frost. They look to have the 1 0 advantage. Catch Madlife warning, he's and he got might it. get him with a cleaver. He's got a cleaver on him, he's flashed in, he gets exhausted instantly by Madlife, but they're going to turn him down. That's going to be first blood in his BB that picks it up once again. Now bottom lane, they are very low. The Carthus Ultimate not coming out, the Snipe's going to come across, that's going to catch Madlife. Here comes the Carthus Ultimate, they might get a double kill, no, a heal from the room. They saved one, but that's going to be the kill of the top lane, the bottom lane, sorry. Here we see Toys going in towards that, there's the teleport from Toys. Water paint not quite landing, but Rapid Star's gonna get Oh, Shed and too! The rebound blitz goes in. Then that's gonna be Shed coming across. They're gonna try and get up towards Shy. Rapid Star's gonna get dropped. Can they take Shy down as well? They do! And it's three kills. Meanwhile, down the bottom, there's another trade. That's an ace! It's a they sonic it very quickly. The Water paint landing. The Crescendo gets across. Mad Life is gonna get caught down here. Fist to go. He's got the Oracle. He's trying to use as much as he can. Lil Ball's getting involved. Ace in the hole being blocked off by Wu. Not the ideal target. Toys is gonna get ready. Toys goes down. First death of the game. That's gonna be calling. The Requiem's gonna come out. It's gonna be Cloud Zoom, but it's a triple kill again. Rapid Star getting torn down. Not gonna find themselves in a 1 1 position. Tied by Assassin. Very, very strong throughout this match. And he's forced now Templar back, man. Madlife tries to support them. Madlife have to use his ultimate to keep him away. Gets the one more stun. He's going to go down first. But for BB. BB could have tried and turn this one. So he seems to be in charge. They're going to close it on Woom. They're going to have the capture rate. They've got the Rapid Star. Rapid Star flashes Woom around the side. Woom, the absolute zero being used. That's going to be one down. Rapid Star drops. Woom is going to get dropped as well. Stanley gets another. Madlife goes down. They make all over him. And they immediately realize the pressure is on. They're going to dive in. Stanley goes, oh. launch it in. Shockwave. Rapid Star exits instantly. Rapid 
Sun, well, Rebirth will drop, Rapid Size goes down, Woog trying to pull something out here, Stanley with the ball on him, he's going to jump back onto Rowan Woog, Woog going to get dropped, Side by Assassin are destroying, one might not allow him, and well, I'm seeing on the screen, it is the a surrender. surrender! He has, Mad Life's going to go down, there's no way in hell he's ever going to escape this one, the kill's being given to Toys, and oh. that is for Big fight up top. They're pressuring on towards Mad Life. They might get him in. True Shot Barrage just about missing the stakes. Trying to go aggressive. There's Stanley coming in. There he goes. Whoops going to go down, but I think he might get a kill from the top. Oh, wow. No. He escapes it. Going to try and dive. Transfer it in. You can see Cloud Templar getting straight in there. The Lunar Orbital pops them up. Absolute Zero goes off. Stanley taking low. Stanley has to back away. Cloud Templar gets dropped by mistake. Can they turn the aggression though? Shy's going to be targeted. BB goes for him. Toy stakes down Shy. Oh, here comes the taunt. There comes. Is the shockwave going to come out? No, they said they caused the ball on Stanley. Stanley is going to try and come across. Cloud Templar is going to get caught out here. He will go down eventually. It's Toys that picks up the kill again. The Groom was exhausted. Taipei Assassin's just going to continue diving on this one. Groom with the Lunar Ultimate is going to walk away from that. And again, they oh! have to. Oh, beautiful stuff. Baby is going to get the first inhibitor to it. Rapid Star tries to keep them up there. Groom's got caught. The Lunar Ultimate, he does get dropped. Two shot barrage from BB. The inhibitor's gonna go down. Meanwhile, the bottom turret is also going down. And Shy is getting dropped already. BB to a true shot barrage going across there. Then that's gonna be Cloud Temple ultimate across, but he did really manage to catch up towards Stanley. There's the Lulu ultimate, it's not enough. There is no damage coming out from Azubu Frost. Side player says it's the Dune. No, oh, the shockwave pulls in Cloud Temple. BB picks up a kill on Chase there. Shy goes down. Mad Life getting skipped. Oh, Rihanna picks up another kill. Side player says it's other season two. This was a team who hadn't played in hardly anything internationally. They were a ragtag group of players from Southeast Asia, which had historically been a very weak region. Yet somehow, they managed to beat the best Western team at the tournament, be the first team to not only take a single game off Koreans, but sweep them in the quarterfinals, and against all the odds, win everything against what was, until then, the best team in the world. Taiwan was not as strong of a region as Korea, and quickly after this tournament, we went into the situation we have today. Koreans winning everything, only losing to other Koreans. No region has come close to toppling the behemoths of the East at a Worlds ever since then. Taiwan itself hasn't managed to produce a team who could ever live up to the hype of the Assassins ever again either, with no following rosters produced by the country ever coming close to another World Championship. This was just one team one group of players who just so happened to be the perfect roster to pull off three of the greatest upsets of all time. Toys would unfortunately never be able to live up to the hype of his performance at that Worlds ever again. Later on in his career, he'd get Carpal Tunnel Syndrome, which unfortunately, while it's a very treatable and easy to fix thing for pros nowadays, it went undiagnosed and untreated for long enough that it pushed him into retirement. Nowadays, he's a part owner and coach of the LMS team G. Rex. Little Balls did never succeed much outside of TPA either. He played with the team for a while longer, but eventually left them after it was revealed that he had been caught using someone else's account to play ranked in solo queue and would be suspended for elo boosting for one year. He claimed that he was using the friend's account to try and play league with lower queue times, as queue times back in those days could get up to 40 minutes or longer in high elo. He was last seen as the head coach of the team Midnight Sun, but they disbanded in 2016. The rest of the roster never accomplished much as players either, surprisingly. They stuck together and played a few tournaments following the Worlds as TPA, but they never managed to take first place at any event that wasn't a local back in Southeast Asia. For some reason, each one of them would eventually fall by the wayside and leave the team for one reason or another. This actually started a trend where, surprisingly, most of the World Championships in League of Legends were won by teams that eventually broke apart or disbanded after winning it all. TPA would never never reach those high highs ever again, and sadly, probably wouldn't ever end up playing League together again either.
However, as I was making this video, an event just happened one week ago before writing this. Here, in August of 2018, there was an event called the Taiwan Championship Legend. The tournament itself doesn't seem to be too competitive, as none of these teams are obviously LMS teams, although there were some pro LMS players playing for these teams, so I'm not too sure about that. But more interestingly than the structure of this thing, there was one show match where some of the biggest streamers in Taiwan would face up against that same old roster from more than half a decade ago. Hey, 